The Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association is pleased to present Wes White with Turn the Page, featuring Ron Dart. How should members of the church deal with troublemakers? Or what about divisive issues that get brought into the congregation? Issues such as church politics, lust for money, or attempts to grab power. When things like this happen within the congregation, too many times the first thing a person wants to do is to appeal to ecclesiastical authority, you know, tattletale to the minister. And usually this is the worst possible solution. The best approach among Christian brothers and sisters is one-on-one -on -one communication. Directly confronting someone is a grassroots action and a grassroots, basic, low-level, direct encounter is the most effective approach when dealing with your church brethren. It may not always be easy, but it usually yields the most favorable results. Now, dealing with problems should never be accompanied by anger or resentment. These encounters should be done with humility, with logic, with controlled emotion, and ideally, these attempts at resolving interpersonal differences should be done quickly, as soon as possible, in person and in private. Ron Dart has an important message that shows us that we should never neglect problems within the body of Christ, thinking they'll just magically go away. No, the church of God is like a garden that needs regular maintenance. Problems in the church don't just somehow disappear. So let's turn the page back to 1986 as Ronald L. Dart delivers a powerful sermon entitled Confrontation Versus Authority. One of the objectives of the church that we take for granted is that it is a desirable thing for a church to grow, right? I mean, it's just something that nobody really discusses very much. You just think church ought to grow. It'd be good for the church to grow. And we're encouraged by growth and we're depressed when we don't get growth. Now, there are those who, once we start talking about growth and looking for ways to grow, say, well, you know, grow is growth for growth's sake. I mean, what are you looking for growth for? I mean, we're supposed to live the Christian life, and they have some question. But, you know, if you think about it a little while, the, the logic of the benefits of growth are absolutely overpowering. For example, if you just understand, you know, the, the dynamics of the situation, if we had double and triple and quadruple the size of our local congregation, would we or would we not be able to distribute and work out our Sabbath school arrangements more easily? Of course we would. It would be easier to distribute your children into age groups. You would also have more people available from which to draw teachers for Sabbath schools, and therefore the quality of the teaching the children are getting would probably improve if you have more people. That's not difficult to follow, either, is it? Now, another thing that is very obviously going to happen if your church goes on up to 100, 150, 200, 250, is that as time goes on, the odds begin to increase that we might have an organist, someone who could play this organ that was so kindly donated to us that none of us know how to play at present. You know, we could go hire someone to play the organ for us, but it's not the same as having someone in your own congregation. So the musical program is almost certain to improve as a church grows. You have musicians that will come into the church. You have singers who will be able to do special music. And you really have got to reach a certain size before you can have a choir. Because right now, if we moved our choir up here, there would be no one to listen to it, right? I mean, we have enough people here to make about a comfortable small choir. And we could work with everybody, but then who would we sing to? So your musical program is plainly going to increase. Now, what you may not have thought about either, though, is it also improves your sermons and sermonettes. Not merely because of the number of people who might be available to give sermons and sermonettes, but because the preachers tend to do better, work a little harder, I guess. I don't know what it is, but are, are lifted by the larger congregation. It's a benefit to us to know that we have the television camera back here and the tape going and that people will hear us. It's a benefit to me at home. Once I get here and start speaking, it doesn't help that much. Uh, because what I see is what's here, and I talk to you, and I raise my level of delivery to fit this congregation. So basically, when your church gets bigger, you get better sermons, you get better sermonettes, and you get better social activities, too. You have more people, actually, that'll show up for a chili cook-off, more people that'll be here for a potluck, uh, whatever kind of a supper or get-together. You're going to have larger groups 
more people to do the different things that need to be done. Uh, the, there are, with more people, the odds of finding people with special skills and the ability to really organize things becomes greater. And so, so as you get bigger, you can just accomplish far more with what you have. It's even better for the shy people among us, the people who like to fade into the background because there's more background to fade into. So really, it's, it's just better for everybody. This is one reason, as a matter of fact, why we have not wanted to proliferate small fee sites around the country. It's because you need those fee sites to reach a certain size in order to have a choir, in order to have enough pool of people to find special music, in order to have enough people to put together social activities and outings and things to do that pull us all together. You can have a better fee site as it gets larger up to a point. There is a point, of course, where it all becomes cumbersome and breaks down. There naturally would be an op optimum size. But then you get the benefit of being able to divide the fee site into two locations and make it much more uh, accommodating and, and easy to get to for more people. So it just keeps right on working in your favor. And when there are more people, then there are more opportunities to serve. And when there are more people to do the serving, then more service is performed. And the process, people are helped. God is glorified, and the net bottom line of the whole thing is that people grow when the church grows. It's simple, isn't it? The more chances you have to serve and to do things and to accomplish, the more you personally grow. And the more of us there are, the more people there are to serve and to work together. The more interaction takes place, the chances are better you'll have a neighbor or somebody close to you living in the church. Your range of friends is improved and increased. And so I just think, you know, there really is is not much of an argument against growth from either a biblical or a logical standpoint in the church. Everything works better. Well, almost everything. Almost everything. There is one result of growth that is a serious inhibitor of further growth. Inevitably, it creates problems. As a church grows, it will inevitably bring itself into crisis. Now, I am not talking about persecution. Persecution can come about as a result of growth, but history tells us it does not inhibit growth. Weirdly, you'd think it would. But persecution drives the church together. It tends to make people more dedicated. It tends to weed out people whose interests and concerns were peripheral and giving you a much more dedicated core. And people work harder. And history has shown us that the church grew in the face of persecution. No, what I'm talking about is the inevitable struggle for influence that arises whenever men try to work together. It is as natural, as inevitable, as tomorrow's sunrise. You gather a group of people together. You have a goal. You're going to try to accomplish something. And the struggle for influence at its lowest level Power at its higher levels is inevitably going to become a factor when it takes place. Now, from what I've said before, you realize that more people here represents more power. Therefore, there is more to struggle for. And as goods are increased, so they are increased that eat them. So as influence increases and power increases, they are increased who want it who desire it, and would like to get hold of it. Now, Paul addressed the matter to the Ephesian elders in a way we've heard it many times before. Let's look at it one more time. It was a matter, I think, of deep sadness to him, certainly a matter of deep concern. I think he would have preferred to have continued the persecution. He had had enough of that. He'd gone through his share of it and borne his share of it. But I really believe Paul feared more what was about to happen to the church because of its growth and its success then he feared what had been happening to it through the years of persecution and hardship that he had had to personally endure. He is in Ephesus, <coughs> on the beach, I suppose, with the elders of the Ephesian church. Actually, not in Ephesus. He is one town away on the beach, and he asked them to come down and meet him there. He did not go to Ephesus himself. He said in verse 28, Take heed now, I want you to pay close attention, to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. To feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, 
to draw away disciples after them. Remember and watch, remember, but over a space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone with night and day with tears. The remarkable thing about this is, to me, how little help he gives them in dealing with a situation which he knows is going to arise. He tells them two things. Watch and feed the flock. And that's just basically all he says. He, he doesn't give them much more in the way of instructions. And I, kinda, I can't help but recall or think back to a time in Paul's life when he felt that the way to deal with heretics was to arrest them, drag them off to prison, torture them for information about more heretics, and if necessary, put them to death. It was this the way he thought it should be done? Now, at a much later time in his life, with the full realization of the problems that are going to beset the church, he tells them that your defenses are to watch and to feed the flock. There's some interesting things that Paul says here, things that I think are revealing about the situation that we may ourselves face as time goes on, as our church grows, as I certainly, it is growing, and I certainly expect it to grow still more in the years ahead. The first significant thing Paul said was, after my departing, grievous wolves will enter in. He really did not expect this to take place while he was there. Now, I think the reason for this is fairly evident when you th sit and think about it for a while. Paul was the one who came there and preached the gospel in the first place. He was the messenger from God. He was the one that had persuaded them and helped them to understand the truth. He was himself, of course, a powerful leader. But throughout this period of time, and while Paul's ministry was active and still working directly with the church, the power, the influence, was centered on Paul, was it not? Even those other individuals who held some powerful or some influence in the church at this time did so as an extension of Paul's influence. Paul had power. Paul approved of Timothy. Therefore, Timothy had power. Paul had power. This man, he did not approve of this man. Therefore, this man was bad. Power was badly diminished. So consequently, Paul's approval or disapproval had an enormous amount to do with the structure of power in the early church. After my departing, the power will no longer be so focused, but it will still be there. And then the struggle for that power begins. Not that it had not already begun. It had already been going on at considerable length in the New Testament church, and the writings of Paul and Luke and John and Peter all make it very clear that such problems arose very early. Now he addresses the kind of situations. He says there are basically two kinds of situations that you're going to face. One, grievous wolves are going to enter in. They're coming in from outside. Now, the, the implication of all of this is that these people never were converted, <coughs> never repented, <coughs> never accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, except possibly as an outward act verbally. But he says these people pretended to be something they were not. They were wolves in sheep's clothing, and they entered into the flock with a deliberate purpose to control, to grasp, to get. So this in itself is interesting. The, the Greek word, by the way, for grievous, uh, we think of something being a grievous, we think of it being very bad instead of just bad. But the Greek word actually is, uh, comes from a root which means heavy. A burden is grievous if it is a heavy burden. In fact, the word for burden is exactly the same root as the word for heavy in the Greek. So these are burdensome, heavy people, he says. They're, they are people who are a burden to you, which is kind of interesting. Remember the old song, he ain't, no, he ain't heavy, he's my brother. And the corollary, you aren't my brother, you're just heavy. Well, these people fall in that category. First, they are grievous or heavy, burdensome wolves who enter in, not sparing the flock. Now, that language doesn't really quite say all that much to me, and I had to stop for a moment and think, what does that mean? What does it mean when you are not sparing somebody? Well, basically, to me, it means you don't show very much mercy. You know, you really don't show. If you spare someone, well, the idea is, well, I'm extending mercy to this person. I'm sparing what them what I might otherwise have done. The idea of sparing somebody is, well, here is a burden. It's a very heavy burden that I could lay upon them, but I will spare them and not do that, right? So I've got a, 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 an attitude of sparing the flock. These men do not spare the flock. They, are, they, they have no consideration 
for the people. It's an interesting thing to contemplate, isn't it? When you think about the kind of a pattern you might have, that the objective then of a person who comes in like this, from the outside, who is deceptive in his, his approach, who is coming in with the objective of gaining something from the people, what does he want? Well, naturally, he's not going to think about how much weight it puts upon the people's shoulders to take certain types of actions. I recall, in fact, one thing that was done many years ago, where I was, I forget where I was at the time, but I got this letter that suggested that I go down to the bank. The work was in a lot of trouble at that period of time. Go down to the bank, borrow a sum of money, and send that money into headquarters. I was even suggested what I might tell my banker when I borrowed that money, that it was instead of something other than the fact that I was going to borrow it to send it into my church. Now, that action was taken without any consideration for its impact on people's lives for that month and the month after and the month beyond that. It really was. It was taken without adequate consideration for economies that might have been made, for money was still being spent for an awful lot of things that could have been curtailed during that same period of time. I think that this is the kind of thing we're talking about. I don't know who the wolf was. Really. I don't really know the history of who recommended that action. I have an idea. But I do know that it was done, and I do know it was inconsiderate of the people. I do know this is exactly the kind of thing Paul was talking about when he talked about burdensome, heavy wolves coming in who aren't going to spare the flock. They're going to be a burden to the flock. What's their motive? Why are they doing this? The answer is really very simple. Money and power. That's all there is to it. You don't have to look very far or try to figure out what is going on. It is money and it is power. Turn a few pages back in the book of Acts to a, a familiar again, but rather interesting il illustration of this situation, what it means and how it worked in the church. We read in Acts 8, chapter 8, and verse 9. Philip has come up to Samaria and has preached the gospel here, and the people have received it with great joy. There was, however, a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out, in other words, he was giving out, that himself was some great one. It was self. His, his motive is very plain right from the very beginning. It is self-exaltation. It is, in a word, power. Because it goes on to say, they all gave heed, they listened, they accepted him, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And it was what he wanted. It was power. And he wanted it however he could get it. To him they had regard, because a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. Now, people like Simon are shrewd, uncommonly shrewd, whereas you and I oftentimes will get caught out by, by a major change going on in the world around us or in our society and not realize sometimes that the fundamentals even of our economic system are changing. People like Simon spot it because they are attuned to that type of thing. And when he began to preach the things concerning Jesus Christ and, the, and, the, and Simon saw how the people responded to that, Peter, uh, Simon was sensible enough, shrewd enough, to sense an underlying change that was in the process of taking place and knew enough to go with it and not fight it. And so Simon, when they, he, they said, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. And he was amazed, looking at the wonders and the signs that were being done. I mean, he was impressed. They did it better than he did. Now, when the apostles that were in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John. And when they came down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet, the Holy Spirit was not fallen upon any of these people. So they came down, they prayed for them, and they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Well, why not? After all, it was an investment. Do you suppose, in the process of offering them money for this gift, he anticipated getting a little money back later on with the gift? Of course he did. It's the most clear illustration of his underlying motive he could ever give, was to offer money for the gift that was offered to him. Give me this power. What do you want? Power. And I say, you say, well, I thought you said you wanted money. Do you realize there's hardly any difference at all between the two? Money is power. Money is really a subset of power. It actually is something that leads you to power. Oftentimes, the wolf that comes in 
is as much concerned about the money as he is about anything. But that's another story. He said, give me this power upon whom I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you have thought that the gift of God might be purchased with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent of your wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. And he said, well, pray the Lord that none of these things that you have said will come upon me. Now, there's several interesting things about this, but the most interesting thing, the thing I want you to focus in on right now is Peter's response to this wolf in sheep's clothing was confrontation. Immediate confrontation. He did not beat around the bush. He did not hem and haul. He did not, apparently, for all we know, shout and scream at the man. He did not threaten the man. And what you may never have noticed, he did not disfellowship the man. Did you ever notice that? Were you aware of that? I mean, you were aware of it. You've read it before. But did you ever focused in on it? He didn't disfellowship him. He rebuked him. He called upon him to repent and to pray to God. I think that's very interesting to see how he handled a wolf in sheep clothing who had entered the church and was trying his first move to gain some control. He confronted him right up, right up front. This whole spirit of confrontation seems to have been very evident in the New Testament church. Recall what happened when Peter himself got out of line one day and Paul confronted him to his face on the spot in front of everybody because he felt he had to do it right there, right then. The approach was to immediately deal with a problem as it began to arise to confront, not merely to just simply bluster, to use your authority, to disfellowship, to seal off. Because an interesting thing tends to happen, you see. If Peter had, had called for a couple of deacons here, you know, and, and had this man picked up and carried out and thrown out in the street, some people who were there would have thought Peter was unfair and would have sympathized with Simon Magus, and who knows where that would have gone. Because, you see, one of the favorite techniques of a wolf in sheep's clothing who is actually entering into the church to create this kind of problem is to create a kind of a false we-they situation, become the underdog, and look for sympathy from the little people against those in authority. Peter didn't bite. He rebuked him and called upon him to repent immediately. Now, this is, I think, interesting to consider. To returning back to Acts, the 20th chapter, we find there is a second category of person that Paul dealt with. And this is the one that, I don't know, had I been there on this day and had I heard Paul say these words, it would have bitten right down to the core of my being. I would have spent much time in prayer over this, these next words of Paul. Also, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. I've seen enough of it, I guess, in my time. It's, it's a painful thing. But you see, the Ephesian church, as of this point in time, had not really experienced that. Paul knew, because of his experiences that were beginning to build up on him, and the pattern developing in the church, that it was coming here. And everybody might as well know it's coming here, so they know what to do with it. But what do you mean, speaking perverse things? Language changes over time. The word perverted today has taken on an awful lot of different connotations than from what it had in 1600. And so I think you need to understand that. Probably a far better 20th century translation of the Greek word here translated perverse things is speaking distorted things. Distorted things. Now, Paul spoke elsewhere of those who would distort the gospel of Christ. Now, to distort something, you've got a nice even plank here of wood that you're working with. Unfortunately, it's got a little bit of moisture in it. And you work it into, or maybe let's say it's a stud, you work it into the, into the wall of your house. I've heard people talk about this happening in houses where they go in and they, they build a house and some of these studs happen to be a little bit green. And as the house dries slowly, the stud can begin to twist ever so slightly. Distortion takes place in the wall. And they've actually had it pop the sheetrock right off of a wall where a section of it has twisted like that. And here's the sheetrock comes right out in the middle of your, of your room because of the twisting going on in the studs in the wall of the house. Happens to people every once in a while, even when they work hard to try to get the best possible type of lumber to go in. 
To distort is to twist something. In other words, you don't throw it out and try to bring something new in. You just take it and turn it ever so slightly. Now, this is probably the oldest technique known to man of, of trying to gain control in certain types of situations. You find something that, that the organization stands for or that the leadership in particular stands for. You try to find one part of it, a plank that you can get a hold of, and you take this plank and you just twist it ever so slightly and begin to try to present it as though it were true. And then if it is true and straight, then the rest of this must be crooked. And this is a tried and true technique of people who create division for reasons of personal advancement in organizations. It goes on all the time. It's normal. It's to be expected. Paul said it's going to happen no matter how it's said, but it is going to happen. But it's not just in the distortion of the gospel that this happens, because that, frankly, is one of the least effective means of accomplishing the ends of a person who wants to draw away disciples after himself. One of the least effective means. I'll illustrate what I mean by this. Some time ago, I was called from the field from a local church area by an individual who was having a problem in his relationship with another individual in the church. In other words, it was a matter with the direction the church was going. He called up, asked for a little bit of advice. Unwisely, I gave him a little bit of advice. I say unwisely, and I'll explain to you what I mean later on. My advice was sound. It was straight. He took my advice, you know, turned it just a little bit, maybe formed it, and then used it as a club to beat another member of the church who very shortly thereafter gave me a call on the phone. Did you say, did you say this that he, this fellow told me? I said, well, uh, no, I didn't. Uh, I said something sort of like that, but I sure didn't say that. Well, what did you say? Well, and, well now I explain, talk to him for a little while. A day or so later, the first person calls me back. By this time, I have, you know, I'm a little slow sometimes. By this time, I had figured out what was going on, and I decided, I told both, both individuals concerned, I said, y'all sort out your problem. I'm not helping you anymore. I'm not helping you anymore. And the problem you get into with this situation is people will take the words of someone who is in influence, will distort those words and use it as a club to beat on other people or use it as a lever to move things that they want moved when the person who originally made that statement had no intention of moving whatever it is that they're trying to move. happens all the time. I wish I had a dollar for every time my words had been twisted by someone who asked for either advice or information, and then some time later it turns out meaning something totally different from anything that I had intended to say or accomplish at all. And some people in the field nowadays who might find Mr. Armstrong or I a little reluctant to give advice might be well advised and you don't understand why we might be reluctant to give advice. It's because so oftentimes people who wish to take unfair advantage of other people in the church twist or distort the words of other people in the church. Now, it happens to us, and I dare say if we have a little testimonial meeting in here, you could probably all tell me of situations where people have used your words to unfair advantage with another person. It is a technique, you know, that some people use as naturally as they breathe air. They don't sit down and plan it out. It just happens. They do not deliberately, oftentimes, even intend to do it. It's just as natural as breathing air. Why do they do it? The purpose, essentially, is to disaffect people and to draw away disciples after themselves. The motives are almost identical to the wolf. The difference is where the person originates. The wolf originates outside of the church. This person originates inside of the church. If there is a difference in motive, the wolf is more likely to be motivated by money, the person from the inside more likely to be motivated by power. But those are generalizations. They are not anything that you can really put your finger on. What do you do about it? Now, I've already told you it's inevitable, haven't I? I've said that it just happens all the time. It takes place. Sometimes the people who get involved in it or cause this type of thing are well-meaning people. They really do not set out to cause trouble in the church, and yet sometimes they can leave a trail of devastation behind them that you would not believe. Why am I telling you this? Isn't it my job to keep that from happening? Now, you see, we begin to get down to why I'm talking to you about it. What can you do about it? As I see it, there are two basic approaches that you can take to dealing with this kind of thing that Paul talked about. <clears throat> of course, he said, feed the flock and keep your eyes open and watch. He himself had tried 
Approach number one, while he was, you know, before he was in the church. It's the authoritarian approach. In this approach, what you basically do is you go and you report to the minister misconduct, wrong teaching, heresy, uh, sin, uh, whatever else it is that's going on. You take all that to the minister, and he becomes the focal point of all of the information that is developing in the church. Now, you also want to keep in mind that information is a form of power. And that wherever the information tends to center and build up becomes a very powerful position. So consequently, if all the information is forced into this one person, he is given an inordinate amount of power in the church. Now, of course, his power, because he is the minister, is theoretically and in the beginning legitimate. And his own attitude may be in the beginning legitimate. But as it was said, power corrupts. It is true that power tends to corrupt. And I don't want that power. I do not want to know about the secret sins of members of the congregation. It distorts my sermons. It is almost impossible to give a clean, straight down the line preaching from God's Word on something when you know two or three people in your congregation have a serious problem with it. Either you will hurt them and beat them and be too hard on them, or you will dodge the issue completely and try to be easy on them. You see what I mean? I don't want to know those things. They distort my preaching. They give me too much power. Think about it. But this is what you have to do if you're going to follow the authoritarian reproach. You report everything to the minister, and it's the minister's job to get rid of the troublemaker. You know, he assigns this person to that person. You grab him by the two elbows. You lift his feet off the floor. And out he goes into the street. He's gone. And you don't ever let him in the doors again. And all of us who are left behind have peace. Except for that nagging little thought back in the back of your mind that wonders if you will ever be the one that is propelled out the front door yourself. Because if it could happen to him, it could happen to you. And maybe you realize that they didn't really give him a hearing. Nobody really sat down and said, what is really on your mind? What is really troubling you? They just got rid of it. The other thing that's wrong with this is that when you have an authoritarian structure like this, it is absolutely the most fertile ground for wolves because they can use it to get rid of their opposition. <coughs> All the power is focused. The lines of power are clear. The wolf innately, inherently knows how to get himself into those lines of power, how to get control of the elements of information, and it is right on the lines of information that they will always squat, because that's where power is. And it gives them a perfect tool for gaining control of a group of people here, and control of a group of people, and influence over a group of people here, and give them enough time. And they'll control your organization. They'll control your church. An authoritarian structure, which appears initially to be the best for dealing with this type of thing, actually turns out to be the worst. The fact of the matter is that just like it can get rid of, of, of sinners out of the church, it can also be used to suppress the truth. It can also be used to intimidate the righteous. A lot of bad things can happen with it. Not the least of which is to create an atmosphere of suspicion because it depends on people reporting on one another. and robs the church of their trust, robs you of your ability to sit and listen to a person <coughs> and be able to say, yes, I'll keep it to myself. No one else will ever hear of this. And if a minister comes to you and sits down and says to you, well, now you've got to tell me this, you can tell him, no, you know, I don't have to tell you this. With a big smile on your face, I'm sorry, I really don't. That's what you, but in an authoritarian organization, you can be out of the church for refusing to tell the minister whatever it is that he wants to know. So it does create an atmosphere of suspicion and carried to its extreme. It can result in the Inquisition, which it did, as a matter of fact, in Spain. That in itself, if you've ever studied it, is a frightening illustration of the authoritarian approach to the control of Paul's problem of dissension in the church. It might be worth it if you've never studied it to look at it. The other approach, which Peter illustrates for us, is the confrontational approach. Now, what I see in this in the church is, the, is more than that. It is the grassroots confrontational approach, right down at the, the bedrock of the church. 
One of the most effective methods of wolves is intimidation. Now, it takes far too many forms, really, for me to be able to enumerate them. That would be something a person might want to... It might be worth, worth it to you, as a matter of fact, to get a book called Winning Through Intimidation. Not to learn how to intimidate, but to learn when it's being done to you. Because it is. All the time. One of the most effective wolves of, of, is intimidation. And, and while it sometimes is hard to identify it, it, it directly, it is often identifiable by its objectives, by what the person is trying to do. For example, a lot of people use anger to intimidate. The person who is willing to make a scene will oftentimes get his way among a bunch of nice folks because they want to be nice. They don't want to make a scene. They don't want to cause a problem. They want to show love. They want to get along. So the one person who is willing to make a scene, to absolutely throw things and scream and yell and stomp, everybody gets real edgy and quiet and backs off and says, well, give it to him. It's not worth fighting over. Maybe it isn't worth fighting over. But if it is, don't give it to it. Children learn very quickly that if they can get what they want by making a scene, to make a scene, don't they? I don't have any children, but I sure watched a lot of other people's children over time. And if you let them get away with it a few times, children are smart. They learn very quick. Oh, I know what I do. I'll throw a tantrum and I'll get what I want. So sometimes parents have to put up with a few tantrums and allow a scene to be thrown and react to that scene appropriately in order to keep it from becoming a habit with children. They, but, but the wolf will use it. He will use anger, and sometimes even ridicule. And the object is to overwhelm opposition, to intimidate people into silence. So they do not oppose whatever it is that we're struggling for influence over. It is also used to inhibit opposition. It, it, it shows up, for example, in, in a display of great learning, in a, a flaunting of credentials of one kind or another, I am this, I am that, or as one man once upon a time did it to me, he said, look, I am 50-odd years old, and here I was, of course, I was mere 35 or so, whatever I was at the time, and I was somewhat awed by that, and since I am 52 years old, I ought to, you know, therefore you ought to do what I tell you to do, what it boiled down to do. I wish, you know, you always had to think of these things afterward. And I wish I had quoted the proverb and said, yes, you know, uh, many years should teach wisdom, and gray hair should be an indication of, of understanding, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're not. And Job had to learn from a younger man. Maybe you have a thing or two to learn as well. I wish I'd thought of it then, but I didn't. I didn't think of it till it was much too late. But oftentimes somebody will use, use a great learning or advanced years or some other technique in order to get their way. Sometimes we should stand up before the advanced years, and if it's not an important matter, maybe we ought to yield on it because age does many times teach wisdom. But if it isn't right, we shouldn't give in to it just because someone's trying to intimidate us with his great learning, his credentials, or with his age. Actually, one of the most interesting things about it also is a wolf will oftentimes make very effective use of many, 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 many words. Interminable conversation. Sometimes people, there are, there are people who just simply can't turn it off. And that's, that's, a, that's a lamentable affliction and we should feel for them and pray for them. But there are some people who use it as a device from preventing you from speaking, to prevent you from disagreeing, to prevent you from expressing an opinion, if that happens to be a person who is afflicted, uh, be patient with them. If it is a person who is trying to intimidate you, don't let them. It's as simple as that. Sometimes you have to interrupt people who won't otherwise let you do it. A lot of times, and really the bottom line when you get down to the use of intimidation, it is oftentimes being used simply for the purpose of avoiding the confrontation that I'm talking about. Avoiding. Having someone stand up like Peter did and said, wait a minute. Your money perish with you. Your attitude, your heart is not right with God. None of us like to hear that, do we? Well, a wolf certainly doesn't want to hear it. doesn't want to let those words come out of anybody's mouth. Now, it is in this area that a certain scripture, I think, is best understood. Turn back with me to Matthew 18. We oftentimes now, our most common use of this scripture is when somebody in the church has hurt our feelings or has done us wrong, and we sit around and mutter about it for a while, and you've probably heard sermonettes and sermons, says, look, don't sit around and let that bother you. Go to your brother. Well, I, that, that's fine, and that's good and all that as well. But I'm, I, that, that sort of thing is fairly small stakes compared to what I'm talking about with you today. What I'm talking about today 
is heavy stuff where the church is concerned. Jesus said, Moreover, if your brother shall trespass against you. Now, let me ask you this. If you're having sort of a little unofficial Bible study somewhere, and you all get together, and I don't discourage this at all, and you like to get together once a week, and you have a Bible study, and you're going through some book of the Bible, and some one person is beginning to dominate that Bible study and begins to teach heresy, or begins to speak against what is taught by the rest of the church elsewhere, that person is trespassing against you. Seriously. I don't mean uh, he's trespassing against me down here in Tyler because he says something bad about me. I say he is trespassing against you folks out of the field in your little Bible study. What should you do about that? He says, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. This is what I mean by grassroots confrontation. Don't let it sit there and simmer and fester. Don't let it go on week after week after week. Go talk to the person and tell him his fault. And tell him you should not be doing that. If you disagree with what the rest of the church is, is teaching, there is an avenue open to you for the presentation of your ideas. Run it through the ministry. Don't run it over us. Because that's the difference. It's running it through the ministry and over the, the, the Bible study or the local church. Go tell him his fall between you and here alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. And the fact of the matter is, he may not be a wolf at all. He may be a well-meaning but misguided and, and thoughtless person who needs somebody to come up and say, put a hand on his shoulder and say, you know, I really wish you wouldn't do that. It bothers me for you to do this. Couldn't you consider, let's don't do that until we've had a chance to let, you know, write up a paper on it and send it in and let somebody else look at it. Let's don't disturb or discourage or, or create divisions in our local church, huh? A well-meaning person will respond well to that. A wolf may get mad, may get angry, may bluster, may attempt to intimidate. A shrewd wolf will go along with you, and then you'll have it to do again later on. But if he will not hear you, then take one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Why do you have to establish every word? Because a wolf is a genius at distortion. Remember, the man, even from among yourselves, will arise speaking distorted things. And you want to be able to establish every word that you said when you were dealing with such a person. And if he shall neglect to hear them, then tell it to the church. And if he neglects to hear the church, then and only then, let him be unto you like a heathen and a publican. Now, I think that that's, you know, powerful advice. It is some of the least heeded, though, of all of the words of Jesus Christ. If I had to look for all of his teachings to find some of those that were probably done the least by Christians anywhere, I'd almost have to come right down here to Matthew 18, verse 15. Of people don't want to do it. And the fact of the matter is, the health and the welfare and the well-being of your church is at stake. It depends upon grassroots, low-level, basic confrontation. Now, I want to stop right here and explain something, though. By confrontation, I don't mean a shouting match. I don't mean standing there and screaming at one another so loud that the hair is flying back in the breeze out of your mouth. I don't mean that. Confrontation of the type I'm talking about should never be angry and never be resentful. And if you at the moment of time and when you're ready or feel that you're ready to confront and that is your motivation, just shut, your, shut up and don't say anything until you're under control. Because it must never be angry or resentful. Confrontation should always be with humility. Remember that thing, you know, it says, uh, if, if a brother be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, looking at yourself, lest you yourself be tempted. I mean, it's like something where you go tippy-toeing along. Now, a lot of us do feel like when, when we're, we're dealing with some people who are in this category, and this is very true, that... Oftentimes, people who are in the categories of these dissenters described by Paul, they seem like people with their feelings out on their sleeves. It seems like you can hurt them with just almost nothing, and they just either, either, either pout or get mad or get angry or get resentful or blow up or whatever, and you feel like you're on eggs all the time around them. Go ahead and feel like you're on eggs, but confront anyway. Confront anyway. You must do it. Walk, you know, like you're on broken glass. Be careful. Be humble. Take a look at yourself. Pray about yourself and repent of your bad attitude after you've talked to them. But talk to them. If a person is teaching wrong in your presence in the church, say something. Don't let it go on. 
My goodness, people don't seem hesitant to talk to me about it if they think I made a mistake. Why should they be hesitant about talking to a wolf? I guarantee you, I'm not a wolf in the church. If I'm going to drag away some disciples, I'm inside. And they've really been inside. So if I make that mistake, I hope I don't ever. But if you catch me doing it, talk to me. You might save my life. I plead with people, please, you might save my life, as well as that of any other person in the church who does this. If you're going to confront, be kind to people. Don't be mean with them. Don't hurt them. Do what, you know, have, show, show some consideration, some kindness for the person. Whatever else you do, be courteous. Don't use rude language when you're dealing with people like that. Don't lower yourself to the level that they might be at. Don't use intimidation yourself. It's not worth it. Be courteous to people. Be hopeful when you're going to confront somebody. What do I mean by that? I mean hope that the outcome of this confrontation will be a change on the part of the other person. A seeing. When, yeah, I really shouldn't have done that. I appreciate that. I'm sorry. Hopeful. And when you go into it hoping for the best, your attitude is going to be totally different when you go into it expecting the worst. And I hope you don't have to lie to yourself to have some hope, uh, but we must go into it that way. Although I might say there might come a time where even if you can't, you still must go into it. It should always, confrontation should always be loving. It should always come out of an atmosphere of concern for the person you're talking to, concern for the church, not out of defense of your own position. And you know, right here we get down to a reason why it has to be at the grassroots. Many of you do not understand this, and I want you to understand it. When I grab somebody who's teaching heresy and I rebuke him, I can be perceived as defending my position. You cannot. You have no position. In fact, the weaker you are in the church, the lower down the pecking order of power or influence you are, the more effective your rebuke to somebody who's talking wrong, saying wrong, and doing wrong in the church. Do you see that? It's one of the most important things for people in the church to understand. The lower the level, the confrontation, the better. Because if it's happening with one person at the low level, it's probably happening with another that you may not know about. And what a lot of these people may need to hear is rebukes from about a half a dozen or more little old ladies and, uh, and, 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 and just working individuals instead of some, you know, some plumber or, or some guy that's a... Uh, a carpenter or some guy that's you know just works with his hands, who says you know out of kindness just one day looks at you right in the eye and says, you know I I don't think what you said in that sermonette was right. No, you know I really don't feel it's right for you to talk about him behind his back, whoever him is. If that comes back to people, from enough people, do you realize that it'll oftentimes change. You who knows, we could even convert a wolf. Peter didn't rule it out. He called upon Simon Magus to repent. Which means he felt it was possible for Simon Magus to repent. That man who has been defiled for 2,000 years by everybody from the Roman Catholic to the worldwide church of God has defiled Simon Magus. And we don't know but what he did repent. That's the amazing part of the whole thing. Because history tells us almost nothing about that man in subsequent generations. He was made a whipping boy for the church. And I suspect he probably deserved it. But I really have no way of knowing. Confrontation should always be thoughtful, rational, you know, intelligent, logical, not emotional. It should always be prayerful. Maybe you have time to pray, and if you do, you should. Very carefully before you confront. If you don't have time to pray, sometimes you don't. Paul didn't have time to pray before he confronted Peter. And Peter didn't have time to pray before he confronted Simon Magus. If you don't have time to, conf to pray beforehand, do it anyway. And then go home and pray afterwards and ask God to forgive you for your mistakes, if you made any. To forgive you for your lack of love if it wasn't there. To forgive you for your lack of courtesy if you got rude. But do it anyway. But for the sake of the person, not for your sake, but for the sake of the person who's in a wrong spirit, in a wrong attitude. Who knows? You may save your brother. Confrontation should usually be immediate. Or as soon as possible. It's not something you ought to let ride. If you're angry, that's the, re the exception to immediate. You need to wait probably for a little while until you're under control. Confrontation should usually be personal. That is, one-on-one -on -one the first time. That's a rule that Jesus gave us. 
There, however, if you have reason to believe that that's not going to really be effective, then take two witnesses the first time you go, because you may need to establish that right up front. But usually it should be personal, and usually it should be private, between you and the person alone. But I think Jesus is giving that to you as a rule. I don't think he means that if you have good reason to believe you should take the witnesses the first time, that you should take them. Do it. Because it may be necessary for you to have a witness of every word that is spoken, lest you be falsely accused. The value of confrontation at the grassroots level of the church, I don't think, can be overemphasized. The reason is that wolves are fond, as I said before, of creating a we-they situation, especially between the little people and the existing leadership of the church, where whatever that leadership may happen to be, local, general, national, regional, what have you. The idea is, see here, we little people down here are being set upon by those people in Tyler. And those people in Tyler don't understand us little people out here. See what I mean? This is the way this type of thing is often done. So if the little people or some little people call Tyler and Tyler comes down on the wolf, then the wolf cries to all these people, see, I told you. I told you what they would do that they would come down on us out here and look at this letter and they don't understand this and away we go. But if the grass roots rebukes the wolf, can't do it. Doesn't work. What's he going to do? Call Tyler and say, the little people don't understand me. Well, you know how far he'd get with us in doing that. Ministerial confrontation. The grass roots confrontation is important because ministerial confrontation is easily distorted, especially when there are no witnesses or when the witnesses are perceived to be biased in favor of the ministry. We can do it, and there are times when we have to do it, but we have limitations. And we can be rendered ineffective so easily by somebody who's just willing to lie who is convincing about his lie. Because some people will believe it. Grassroots confrontation is more effective. Wolves also are able to paint a picture that only the minister is against them, that the little people are with them. And a lot of people will believe it because they say it. Strangely, they paint that picture. The minister is the only, and the truth may be that the little people are so disgusted with him they can't stand it, but not one of them has told him this. And so he goes on blissfully in his ignorance, assuming that the little people are with him when they're not. And who knows? The time might come when the little people have no choice but to be with him because he's managed to preempt the legitimate power or influence in the church, and now he's all there is. Once upon a time, there was a man who named Diotrephes who accomplished just that. Maybe because the little people in the church wouldn't call him down early enough. He let it go until it got way too late. And remember, wolves will lie, and they will lie effectively. I would not like to think that those from among us who rise up speaking distorted things would lie, but I have to own up to it, they too will lie. It's so valuable. It is important also, I think, that, that wrong teaching and false conduct be rejected at the grass roots by the little people because there is no escape for a wolf when the whole church rejects it. There just isn't. There's just no place to go. When he's getting it from every side, from every person, who says, I don't like what you said. I disagree with you on that point. I don't think you should have even said it. I think you should have inquired of somebody else or inquired of the ministry. I think you should have submitted a paper to the ministerial council. I don't think you should have preached that. Besides that, I don't think it's wrong. And here's why. I don't think you're right. And here's why you're not right. I think we sometimes have, all the little old ladies in the church will please forgive me. I, I don't mean to put you at the bottom rung of all ladders. In fact, I put them very high in the church, but some people don't. I'd love to see, you know, little old ladies who can take their Bibles out and start puncturing some arguments that some of these would-be teachers that rise up here and there start trying to preach and say, well, now, you said this, but look here, there, here it is in the pages of my Bible, because surprising how well some of our little old ladies know that Bible. Some of them are retired, and they spend a lot of time with it, some of them with a magnifying glass. But they know what's in that book, and you start talking to them about it, sometimes they'll catch you if they're not just too timid to speak up. And be sweet, little old ladies, and be easy on them, but, but, but don't let them off, please. The minister can lead in this area, but the minister cannot do it alone. I want you to turn back with me to the fourth chapter of Ephesians in conclusion. Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 1. 
I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Now, this is a letter to the church, mind you, to the whole Ephesian church. Endeavoring. What does endeavor mean? It means to work at it, right? It means do something about it, being, sweat a little bit over it. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Whose obligation is it to maintain unity of the Spirit? The unity of the Spirit. Not just any unity, mind you. Because you can maintain unity with authoritarian approach, can't you? You can keep a church that is tightly together, that is fully under control that way. But is that the unity of the Spirit, or is that the unity imposed by the ministry? It's not the same. The admonition to work for the unity of the Spirit was made to the brethren, to the church, to the membership, not to the ministry. No, we have to work for the unity of the Spirit. But we cannot accomplish it unless the work goes on at the grassroots level of the church. Understand, know that that is true. Endeavoring to keep the unity of Spirit in the bond of peace. Verse 11. Now God gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers all sorts of offices and jobs and responsibilities in the church. In 1 Corinthians he talks about gifts of helps and administrations in the church. He gives you all of these things. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, until we all come in the unity of the faith. Not just any unity. We can accomplish unity by other ways and other means. We're talking about the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is the work of the ministry. And I want you to understand something. I hope you're beginning to grasp this. The ministry can't do it without you. If they do, you will not like what you have. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine and by the slight, the deceptiveness of men, and cunning craftiness wherein by they lie in wait to deceive. I love Paul's choice of words. They even almost bite at you as they come out of the page of the Bible. But speaking the truth, in love, may grow up into him in all things who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together, and compacted by that which every joint supplies, not just the ministry, but every part of the body, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, makes increase of the body in the edifying of itself in love. Beautiful concept. The thing I'm trying to say to you today is don't, people at the grassroots of the church, don't neglect your way into authoritarianism. Stand up and be counted. Turn the Page is a production of the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association. To contact us or for more information, please visit our website, rlda.com.